Hey, what's going on, guys? This is Taylor from The Happy Doc, and I am super excited to record this episode. I'm with Dr. Mike Wu Ming, and uh, yeah, I'm just so grateful to have you on with me today. Taylor, it's good to do this. Uh, I've heard a lot about you, so it was really good kind of talking with you in person, and, and we've talked before this, so I'm really excited to be, uh, be on your show. Awesome, awesome. So, Mike, if you could just introduce yourself, you know, what's your background in medicine? Uh, my background in, in medicine, well, I'm family practice trained. I come from a long list, a long family of doctors. My dad is a pediatrician. My uncle's a thoracic surgeon. My cousin's a dermatologist, other cousin's psychiatrist. You know, I like to joke, it really makes for a really interesting family reunion. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, um, you know, what's, what's much, that table like? It, it's it's really annoying too, you know. It, it, you know, some some doctors can't talk to other doctors unless they get a referral, you know. So it, it's pretty awkward. Oh my gosh! But, but, uh, yeah. So you know, so my mom is a Filipino immigrant. So I come from a family of immigrants, but my mom said, uh, "I only want you to be a doctor, lawyer, and or a banker." And I didn't know what a banker really did. And I was not, I knew I wasn't cut up to be a lawyer. So I guess doctor was the only thing that was, that was doctor's left. default. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, my, my family's Jewish and, and it's, it was always like doctor lawyer for me. There really wasn't a choice. And then later I found out there's so many other options. So. Right, right, right. I, I didn't even know about that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I went to, um, uh, I was born in the Midwest, went to California for uh, my, my family. We moved to California um, but I went to school up in Michigan, in Detroit, uh, Wayne State for med medical school. Um, and then in, in my, and I'm a little bit older than you are, but back in the days, back in the mid nineties, there was this push for primary care. So I, I did family medicine. I went to Mayo Clinic, although I had to get out of the Midwest. So I did it in Arizona mm. and uh, basically just, you know, straight out of uh, residencies, growing to group practice here in uh, San Diego. And that was many, many moons ago. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So, um, yeah, so family trained, it, it sounds like you, like you said, you, you moved out to the West coast. I'm actually from, uh, the Bay area originally. Um, so oh, really? it's, yeah, so I not was, too far. I was actually, um, I was, uh, I lived in San Mateo for forever. Um, I grew up in Mill Valley. Oh, That's there we go. That's awesome. So my, my dad was a pediatrician in Chinatown and he would commute and, um, so the, the house that I grew up, so we moved, we were in Ohio, my dad went to Ohio State, and then he went to, for pediatrics, and then he went to Chinatown, and we bought a house in Mill Valley in 1973, and uh, you want to know how much he paid for that house? Yeah, I'm, I'm super curious, actually. Uh, it was like 80000 and wow. it was, uh, yeah, and uh, if you guys don't know Mill Valley, I know you do, Marin County in general. You know, this house was three stories. It was off a cliff. Beautiful. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's closer to four to five million. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say the housing market there. Like, I mean, ever since you know, because I, I I you know I was there in the nineties and yeah. you know, early two thousands, and like the housing housing market over there, like easily like three bedroom, four bedrooms. You're looking at like at least six, seven hundred thousand. Like yeah. start, if not more. Um, it was, yeah, it was so funny. It was like so he he kept the house until like in the late nineties. And then he was able, he sold it for like a million. And then like somebody bought it, did like two different things, like added more Feng Shui to it and sold it for 1.8, <laughs> <laughs> like nine months later. And then it was just kind of skyrocketed. But wow, yeah, it's a, it's a great place to grow up though. It was a really interesting place to grow up in the seventies. though. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I mean, I wasn't there, but um it is that whole area is so beautiful. I, I love, I love NorCal. It's, it's wonderful. Have you been so, back? Uh, I went there like briefly for some like vacations and stuff. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I don't know if you noticed, I was a competitive gymnast. So we had some competitions. Yeah. Um, I like, we used to have some competitions, uh, up at UC Berkeley. Um, sure. so we, we'd go over there and, um, but yeah, so I, I've been there a couple of times, but you know, not like, not the real thing. So. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 not the real thing. It's definitely a different vibe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I love being there though. Everyone. So the weird thing is because I'm in the East Coast now, and here yeah. in the East Coast, you know, people if you go up to them and talk to them or have a conversation, there's always this like sense of like, what do you want from me? Yeah. Whereas as you know, in the West Coast or like NorCal, like when I was over there, people just 
naturally have conversation and it's usually quite genuine and there's not that sense of like there's nothing more except just like talking you know yeah. and although, um yeah although when I, di I did go to philly i definitely didn't know anything about the right cheesesteak apparently <laughs> and apparently that's like a big deal yeah, there's there's definitely some some spots to go to in Philly for sure. And if you if you get the wrong one, people will will talk about it. Yeah, I don't get the cheese whiz, but again, I'm a I'm a left coaster. So yeah, yeah. Um, you know, to be to be honest, I mean, I think this is kind of taboo. I'm like not the biggest fan of cheesesteaks. So I mean, I've had I've had a few here, but yeah, I um, you know, that's that's something I still. I'm, I'm like I'm not a big cheese whiz fan either. So. <laughs> Somebody's might be coming at your door. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, there's gonna be like there's gonna be pe people here with like pickets and stuff. Um, so let's let's go forward. So you you know you went into the practice of medicine, right? And um, obviously, we all have different journeys. And I know that you've developed your career into uh, thinking more about entrepreneurship and finance. Right. And I know you also have a space in thinking about stocks and all of those other things. So so let's let's paint that picture. What what was it that kind of brought you toward not just from medicine but what like kind of pushed you towards looking at other avenues well i've always been entrepreneurial i mean and, and a lot of times i remember it became because of necessity and i think a lot of times it, it, it happens because of necessity um before i actually went into um and graduated residency and this was in 96 1997 um we were in Arizona at the time, as I mentioned, I was at Mayo, and my wife was working as a librarian at a, at a, at a local university, and I was working as an intern. And I did what the White Coast investors should you never do, is buy a house, which we did. It was <laughs> and uh, she was pregnant at the time, and this was way before family leave and all that kind of stuff. And it was basically, when she's pregnant, and then she has to go to maternity leave. Now we just suddenly lost half of our income. Mm. And as an intern, I'm too young to moonlight. So I was like, okay, what can I do? Well, I'm working a hundred hours, like all the other interns, you know, a week, I, I can't do it. And, but the one thing that I, I've always been, um, I was always, you know, nerdy or geeky or get whatever you call it. Um, I was a pretty strong proponent of the web back then. So I was I was doing stuff with like medical informatics, if you guys know what that is, about computers and medicine. And I started my, I built my first website in 1995. Again, I'm going to age myself. Um, and my, one, couple, first couple of websites I built, one was, um, as everybody was doing, I was studying for boards and, and all that kind of stuff. And I wanted to review software. I was doing software reviews. And then... Um, because I was like the only person or a few people that were doing it, somehow my website, again, Taylor, back then, there was not a lot of, a lot of websites. Right. That I started to get software asking from software from companies asking me if I would like review it. Mm. I was an intern. Uh, I started this in medical school, actually, medical school intern. And then I was like, great. And so, like, as I'm getting boards, I'm getting like free board software. I'm getting like free anatomy software sent to me. And I was like yeah. a guy with a website. And uh, I actually got written up in medical economics for my, my page back then, my website back then. And um, I said, there's got to be something like this. I got all this free software. And at Mayo Clinic, I was actually in charge of working on our residency website. Again, this, again, I'm trying to date this back. This is way, way early, 1996, 1997. Yeah. It's like you could submit Yahoo used to be a Yahoo directory and you could submit your website to Yahoo and then like <laughs> Yahoo. I don't know who it was. Maybe one of the founders says, Hey, thanks, Michael. We'll review it. <laughs> right. And then I'm getting all of these traffic. So I created um, a, a residency website for my residency. And then I started to get questions about like, um, Hey, how do you get into medical residency? How do, how can mm -hmm. I get to medical school? And back then, you know, um, they called them guest books. So people could like put in their questions or like, you know, there was no blogs, but then, but you could, you could ask questions and leave them. And then here I am is like, I'm working a hundred hours a week. I go, okay, this is great. I'm building this website and I'm trying to answer these questions, just trying to be nice, but I don't have the time. 
Right. So I said, you know what? I'm going to create this document and it's going to be called like frequently asked questions about how to get into residency. And it's just like stuff that I had learned. Mm -hmm. I also, you know, later on, I was part of the residency committee. So I had some background in like choosing medical students, you know, to get in. And I just did it just because I didn't have the time. And it was like, I'll, I'll put this out there. And I remember, like, I'm so dating myself here. I no, it's fine. Kinko's. I went to Kinko's and I printed up this document because there was no PDS back then. Yeah. And I said, if you want it, I will uh, send me a check for $15 and I'll send it to you. And I didn't think anything of it. So here's the crazy thing, Taylor. Yeah. I started getting checks in the mail. <laughs> $15. <laughs> And there's a few things I learned. One is never put your home address on the internet. That's usually a bad thing to do. Got it. <laughs> um, and because, and you know, the second thing is, is like, don't put your phone number. I go, I can't really talk to these people. And I said, you could fax, but I was like, do I turn, put it on the fax machine? Am I, I don't know. It was very antiquated, there were, but there was no PayPal. There was no strike. Yeah, of course. Nothing to take payments back. Then. Were people calling you? They were trying to, they were trying, <laughs> trying to call me. Um, but here's the thing is, is I kind of, I kind of latched onto something here. It was like, well, if it's, if it's, if there's knowledge or something, information that people wanted, people pay for it. And so what happened was, uh, and then I was talking to my wife, I said, Hey, we're getting all these checks in the mail. There's like $15 here and there, but it started to add up. And then she says, you know, um, we can turn this into a business. Now she's at home on maternity leave. She says, I can like edit, like we seeing like, we get questions because we had a lot, not only regular pre-med students, we would have like international students mm -hmm. trying to get in. They may be a doctor, you know, in their country, but they're trying to get into the United States and, you know, they're well qualified, but their personal statements, you know, English is, is it's, of course, right. it's not their language. We can correct them. We can, and I knew that there were services sort of like that in my medical school that offered that. We can do the same thing. So then we started to create services. So we would review your personal statement or your resume and um, just kind of be their guide. And it, I can't tell you that I got rich out of it, um, but what it did is it really helped us out economically. It helped pay for a truck. We bought a truck with it. It helped part, pay part of our uh, mortgage with it. And again, it happened because there was no alternative for me to get, bring in income. Yeah. So that was really kind of the first idea about like developing businesses. And just if you have something of value that people want, people will pay for it. Yeah, it's it's interesting because like for you, you know, you were already starting to get into like developing the websites and you had a specialized set of knowledge and you were able to provide that knowledge, right? You're just essentially just trying to be helpful. And right. then you kind of put yourself out there. And now again, like at that time, the interwebs, it's not like a massive <laughs> amount of websites yet. Right. And all of those things. Yeah. So yeah, it's embarrassing to look, if I, if I would go in like the archive machine or whatever. It's called <laughs> you know, it was, it was pretty rudimentary, but uh, yeah, like, like I said, it, it, it just got, got noticed and then it got picked up and, and we had the business until I, I started, uh, you know, full-time work. Mm hmm. Searchability wise, if like, like, I'm just trying to imagine, like if someone looked you up, for example, on Yahoo and they were looked at like, um, how to get into, how to get into residency, would your page have popped up? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, and that's huge. I mean, if you think about back then again, like, you know, if the searchability, there weren't many other websites, right. You were kind of like the avant-garde person putting that information out there. Yeah. And yeah, it was crazy. And, and yeah, I mean, look again, it wasn't, it's $15 here and there. It wasn't going to break the bank, but it, it, it was a valuable venture, which, um, so did that kind of like springboard you into other concepts and ideas? It, it did. And again, so, and th those $15, I learned really quick that I could like increase that price too. <laughs> um, what happened was, so, and then when I left residency, so I, I graduated residency in 99 and then 2000. And um, if you know anything about that time, back, I live in here in San Diego where I've lived, you know, for the last 20 plus years, um, we got hit by the dot-com boom. And uh, if you, I'm sure in history, I don't know how old you were in 1999, but 
people were paying crazy money, venture capital money on just like anything internet related. Mm -hmm. So dog food. Yeah. Pets.com. Let's, let's uh, give millions of dollars. So I started to, because of my website background and uh, always want to do something outside of medicine, just like it was, it was really my outlet to, you know, to do something. And uh, I started a medical uh, advice site. It was a doctor, uh, it was called ask the doctors type site that I developed. And uh, what happened was it, it, it did. And I, I, it did get picked up. It was profitable. I had hired a bunch of doctors to offer this uh, service. Mm -hmm. And uh, it actually, I ended up uh, getting picked up by a, a big health company back then. I flew to New York city at the Javits center and um, they basically quote, bought my website. And unfortunately a lot of other, like other dot com booms, you know, some boomed and some, you know, fizzled right. out and arrows kind of fizzled out. So, um, but it was, again, it was a great lesson. It was a great, great, I, I definitely saw the power of the web and where it could go and then where it, where it could take me. Yeah. And, and look, I mean, you know this much better than I do, but in entrepreneurship, it's not necessarily about succeeding um, in every venture you do. It's about taking a great idea, seeing how the market kind of adapts to it or if the market will take it and if it works great right if not um then you have to pivot you have to come up with a different concept or idea and if that doesn't work maybe the the core concept is just not going to catch but like it's not you know it's not you or me it you know we the the greater whole of people have to kind of decide if um what's the word traction if it's going to garner traction amongst the market right, right um exactly and, and timing is really important. And sometimes you can have a fantastic idea, but it's not executed properly and all those things. Uh, the only reason I know a little bit about it is because like, I'm trying also to put out different ideas out there. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a really interesting place to play. So um, I'm, I'm curious now. So you've moved, you know, you move forward into different ideas and concepts. What, what are the what what are the projects that you're most excited about or what have been you know some of the things i've developed since so what actually so you're you're exactly right because if it wasn't for that failure and I, I, being as egotistical that i am <laughs> i completely blame the administrative uh, the, the startups <laughs> who were involved with that now um <laughs> what, what what happened was um I went back and I, I'm working on the website, but now I'm working full time as a family practice doctor. And my story is, you know, people want to say, well, where did you get that? Because I don't practice family medicine any, anymore. You know, how did that transition happen? Um, so I worked for a primary care group, mostly family physicians, but a few internists, a few OBs, and they were really you know, there were really back then really gung ho family practice, like we want to do everything from cradle to grave. So we had, which is kind of an unusual in the West Coast, you know, family doctors who delivered babies. Mm -hmm. but we were also doing hospital call. I was doing Q4. I was, you know, and, and these were busy calls. They were mm -hmm. calls, you know, um, if you can imagine more than I would do in, in residency. You know, and um, just like a lot of doctors out there, I couldn't say no. So I just, I, I got a guaranteed salary but what I learned is no matter how much more you work, you're guaranteed to make the same amount. Yeah. <laughs> so they said, uh, you know, we want you to get more patients. And we have like, we had like an extended care or an urgent care. I want you to start working in the urgent care. And then so in addition to my 50 plus hours, and then I ended up becoming their urgent care director. We want you to see more geriatric patients. So I became... A nursing home director for three nursing homes, and uh, I th they go, <laughs> didn't you do like Ahmed in in uh, in uh, residency moonlighting? Okay, you're our occupational medicine <laughs> director now, and see if all of our our, our work workplace injuries. Um, but you know, I, I can't continue to say yes, and it, it just got too much. Um, and the, the real big big pivot is just um, you know, I had a son who was uh, autistic, who was autistic. And um, I tried to, you know, I wanted to be, that was a shock to the system in our family. I have two yeah. kids and I wanted to take some time off. I wanted to go part-time and he really couldn't give, offer me part-time because I was doing all these different things. And, and so I, I quit. I mean, and it's not two weeks and you quit. 
Uh, it took me six months. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I was a shareholder at the time, so I had to pay money back. But what allowed me to do is that was I had a startup a company that I got that really bloomed. I was doing consulting work and um, I started to, 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 it was really blossoming into that. It eventually led to a software company that, um, and that's really what helped my transition out. Um, and then I was out, I was, uh, I left in 2004 and I'd been out of medicine for about nine or 10 years and, or not 10, 2010, 2009 is when I actually, um, uh, decided to come back into medicine because we had sold the company back then. But uh, it's been a big transition to do that. Um, so, yeah, that's it's kind of. Yeah. No, and it, it's it's interesting because like, um, you know, I'm it's it's great timing to hear the story, actually, because I'm uh, currently in the uh, job searching section of my mm -hmm. life and, yeah. um, you know, l going into like this whole contract negotiation, all that stuff. And I think one of the things like you're really pointing out, which is super important, and I'm, I'm happy to have learned a little bit of, of it, is when you receive X dollars, right? And uh, whatever your responsibilities are in your contract, for example, you have to be very clear with the employer and have the conversation of like, are we going to, are, is there going to be extensions to what I can and can't do? Or is this the exact list of things I can do? And if we do add on things, am I going to be, you know, paid more or is this the expectation, right? And, uh, you know, obviously, but there's a lot more conversation about this type of stuff now, but before, um, you know, there was just kind of like this over and I, and you know this, but like the culture is like always about working more. It's always about helping more. It's always about helping more patients, which is great right. until, uh, you know, in your situation, you couldn't do it anymore. It was impossible. Right. Um, remember they said, and cause I came straight out of residency too. Right. So it's, it's about being a team player. So you need to be a, to be a team player. Um, and I think too, is like, Obviously, we, it was me and another another doctor who came in, and he actually quit after about a year. Um, but you know, we were the young guys, and, and these guys have been in practice, most of them, you know, at least ten years out. So maybe there was some naivete in our, our part of it. Mm -hmm. too. But uh, yeah, you really have to set those guidelines, or sometimes some people will take advantage of you. Let's let's face it. Yeah, and um, I mean, you know, you had to you had to do something, right? You had to. Yeah find a way to shift out because, uh, it wasn't, you know, I mean, families, you know, family is so important and you had to figure out how to do that. Um, so, so, you know, you went down other ventures. When did, uh, like the bootstrap MD concept come in? Right. So uh, right about then. So I started working with, um, just regular, regular folks who wanted to start their own online business. And in, in fact, some of the doctors that I used to work with ended up becoming some of my, my clients. And it was about just how can I create something that I feel like, like something of importance, can I sell that on the web? And this is, you know, now it's commonplace to talk about creating your own online course, uh, you know, creating uh, workshops, creating seminars, creating assets, and but back then there wasn't a lot of it. So I started doing that it just kind of on the side. And then I was realizing people were paying me more than I was making as a doctor. And that that got me got me thinking that that we could eventually uh, grow this out. And I've I, it's led to me developing different companies. So I've had a marketing company. I've had a publishing company. And I started working with just general general folks and then over the last 10 years, I've been working specifically with physicians. And the reason why I like physicians, obviously, is because I am one. And um, I know, for the most part, how they think, um, unless you're like a neurosurgeon. I still, there's some <laughs> neurosurgeons. I just know for neurosurgeons. Well, that's, that's a whole different <laughs> level of something. <laughs> but just like me, you know. Um, I could say I was burnt out and as, as unfortunately as many of our colleagues, colleagues are, and they, they're, they're people, they're smart and they know that they want, there's something out there and whatever the causes of burnout, I'm certainly, that's not my expertise is they feel like they're not being heard, that there's something out there that they can provide something of value and in their job, they are not getting it. So I started working with doctors who want to develop their own app. Um, I'm working with someone who's helping. They're building up a med spa in Florida. Um, I've experienced. I own my own med spa. So all these different types of experiences that I could give. 
And it's really kind of a paying it forward. And um, I've been doing that for the last 10 years. And I really got serious over the last five years. And to be honest, one of my main reasons of doing it is one of my uh, clients was a, um, was a surgeon in, out of Dallas. And he had a, a, he had a practice, um, it was cosmetic surgery practice. And I would have these workshops that I did in San Diego that we would fly, and um, and he would he wanted to get his own book written and and other things developed, and I said, hey, you're going to join us at our next workshop we're doing, and he said, you know, I'd love to, Mike, but I have to think every time I leave, I'm losing money. So if I leave my practice, I'm losing money. Right. He was so tied in, you know. He's he's. Um, He's the business owner, but he's responsible for for the you know getting paid to getting 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 paid. And uh, my thing was like develop these all these different assets, so you're building in more passive streams of income. Um, and what happened was um, we were at uh, A4M, which is an anti aging conference out of Vegas that, that we attended. I, I saw him. We had a project that we were going to do together, and as a young guy, this guy was like. Uh, late fifties, but just great shape. You look like 20 years younger. You <laughs> climb, uh, you know, Grand Canyon, do all these crazy things. I couldn't even imagine, <laughs> but, uh, you know, sad story. He passed away, mm. uh, before. And, you know, I went to his funeral. It was very sad. Um, but it was, what I was always reminded me is, and, and obviously there's probably different reasons was that him telling me that he couldn't leave his practice and he owned his own practice. So he was, he could decide what he wanted to do for, for the most part. And it was just, um, that was, and I'm thinking if, if there's, there's one, if there's uh Kevin's name is Kevin. If Kevin, there's a Kevin out there, there's probably like a thousand other Kevins that are out there. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And uh, that's why I've always been, you know, there's definitely different ways that you can make revenue. But my whole thing is with doctors is like, if your whole paycheck is determined on how many patients you see that day, you want to look at you, look at an exit strategy or, or think about something else because you can only go for that for so long, in my opinion. Yeah, and and you know I'm I'm learning about this a lot more just because of my own education with business. But if you're the dependent factor of this wheel that you've created functioning, um, like you said, you're trapped, right? Like you are the that important cog in the wheel. Um, and, and if you don't think about how to create systems or teach someone else to, you know, come in or have a couple of like redundant parts to come in and help out with that process, you're going to get really, really tied up. And I think that's, you know, again, comes back to your experience as an entrepreneur, making those mistakes, developing multiple businesses, you know, you developing bootstrap MD to help other, you know, people that are trying to go through this. Um, because if you don't have the awareness if you haven't done the reading, if you don't have the experience, if you don't have the coaching, then um, you're just going to get trapped. And like poor Kevin, you know, again, I didn't know him personally, but, you know, could could have this could this individual have had more effective or more joyful or, you know, as the happy doc, right? I'm thinking about from the point of fulfillment, like, could you have had more fulfilling times, right? More more times to be able to go on these trips or hang out with friends or, you know, do things like that. So um, yeah, well, I, you know, it's a, it's a good story to share. Um, so, so you, you did, you know, bootstrap MD, you've been helping lots of people, you've been developing different ideas and you also came out with a book. Tell me more about the book you, you uh, developed. I did. It was on my bucket list. <laughs> the book, um, it literally took me 15 years to write the book, uh, the, 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 the book. And, um, not that it actually took me that time. It was like, Every year I said, okay, I'm going to write a book. I got to write a book. And I never did it. And then I, a couple of years ago, I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to do it. I got it, you know, because I say the same thing to my clients. It's like, okay, how much income do you going to put it, this off? So I did. And the book is called The Position of Physician. And basically it talks about, you know, my journey from being the burnt out family doc to developing a seven figure business um, and then re pretty much retired. I was retired and then. Um, what's that? I forget what movie this is. Every time we go out, they, they pull me back in. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so now currently I, I, I am in medicine, but I'm what I call the, the, uh, the CEO 
of, of my company. So we have a, I have a, my own clinic and I've got a series of uh, wellness clinics here in Southern California and other different ventures that I do. I had a marketing company, um, different aspects of it. But just to, basically it teaches, uh, I give two, two strategies for doctors on if entrepreneurship, if that's something that they want to do, and I'm not saying entrepreneurship is the only answer, it certainly is not. But if you want to, I talk about two different ways that I think are probably the easiest things for doctors to do. One is if owning their own practice, whether it be a, a cash-based practice, whether I have a, my expertise in med spas and, and in weight loss clinics, um, but it could be a physical therapy clinic, uh, it could be one. Uh, and then the other one is just being a consultant or a coach. Uh, basically using your own knowledge and to help others. And what I love that one, I th I think it's the ultimate uh, side gig because you can do this if you're full-time, if you're part-time, mm -hmm. if you're hired, if you're even in, in residency, you, you can do that. And it's just basically, do I have something of value? Is it enough of value that people are willing to pay for it? And then through the advent of zoom and all these things, we don't have to physically go there. They're just asking for your knowledge. And if you, and if, and I'm sure you talk about that. This the more that you can help others, it comes back, you know, a hundredfold back to you. Absolutely, and 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 I love it because you know, again, I I think I I, I teach med students, and I'm I'm constantly around them and in, in residency, and you know, I think it just everyone's telling you that you're pigeonholed into a single way of doing things. But I really like you know, with your book and with your experience as well, as you know. It's not like you can just do one thing. There's multiple facets, multiple right. options, multiple streams of assets or passive income streams. But if you aren't even aware of how you can use your talents to develop that, you won't take those steps, right? Like for me, for example, you know, shameless plug, right? I, I do some podcast coaching on the side, right? But I wouldn't have developed that if I didn't go out of my way to say, I like talking to people, maybe I should start recording. Right. And like the, the, you know, your book, like what I love about books, what I love about experience is this isn't you, like you said, it took you 15 years to write this book. Right. What I love about the experience, it's, this isn't just something you pulled out of anywhere, right? You've, you've lived it. You've, you've made the mistakes. You had the failures. You've, you've found things that actually work in reality. Right. And, and you're, you're imparting that. And, and that's why I love, you know, listening to books, reading books, because it just takes that like moment when you're finally, a, you're ready and you read that sentence and it's like, and then, and then you get the inspiration or you're listening to this podcast. Um, I'm, I'm curious, actually, as I'm, I'm saying that out loud, did you ever have like a, like a mentor or this, did, were there moments where like someone inspired you to take that next step? Oh Yeah. I, I, I hired a lot, a lot of mentors <laughs> in, in my day. Um, obviously, you know, ultimate mentor was my dad. And uh, but I've had mentors, business mentors and anything that I want to, uh, you know, study. I mean, we talked about how I got involved in stocks. Well, I hired two stock mentors and I wanted to trade options. So I, I hired those those mentors. Um, because, and I, I think a lot of times too, as doctors is like, I've talked to some docs who say, you know, well, that costs too much money or I'll try to figure it out on my own. Or my favorite is, well, I can just learn it on YouTube and uh, that'll be good. Um, if you're a surgeon out there and you learned surgery through YouTube, <laughs> uh, please call your medical board. <laughs> and turn <it> <laughs> um, But I, if somebody's already shortcut their way and they figured it out, why do I need to spend the time trying to mm -hmm. figure it out myself? I'm not that smart enough to do that. Um, so I had mentors in business, in self-improvement. I'm a big fan of personal development. Just anything that I can do to, you know, make myself better and then, you know, eventually help my my clients to be better. So um I'm sure you've got mentors that you have currently as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I actually wanted to, you know, mentorship is is really great. I love it. And, you know, obviously one of the benefits is uh, not only the skills, but like there's also intangible benefits. Like sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And these people right. have already, you know, that's the biggest thing, right? You don't know what you don't know. So then this person has already had those ranges of experiences so they can impart that more efficiently, right? 
Um, but I'm curious, like, you know, everyone knows what a great teacher might feel like or look like, but have you had times where you've, where you've spent money and like, you've just, it just didn't work out. Like, how do you tell when it's you, you are spending money and it's not going to be effective? Like, do you have any? Yeah, I, maybe I'm the optimist and I always try to find something in there that mm -hmm. makes it good. And, and don't get me wrong. I do my due diligence. You know, I research, you know, who else, who have you worked with? Mm. Happen and make sure that they have the experience. I haven't had too much of it. Um, you know, a lot of times too is when I have when I call the mentors. Sometimes it's not actually per se being the paid. Like they're the only mentor in the group. I'm a big fan of masterminds as well. Mm -hmm. So I'll join like a mastermind where maybe like they have the mentor who's like the lead, and then I'll have um, I'll have uh, you know people who are in the mastermind who I might actually learn more from. Because they they're in different sources of businesses. I think one thing that would work well with me is I would be in these business masterminds, and um, some of the masterminds that are that I had back in the day are pretty well known figures now. Um, I'm not familiar, familiar with Russell Brunson. Yeah, he's been a friend of mine for 20 plus years. His 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 dad was my accountant. <laughs> and, Wait, uh, Russell Brunson's uh, Click Funnels, right? Click Funnels, yeah. yeah. Which is Seventy-one million dollar business back then. He gave me a free account, and I—I I was so stupid I didn't take him. On it. <laughs> but I'm actually a paid member of it. I pay him four hundred dollars a month for it. So him, Frank Kern was a mentor to me. He's a big internet uh, 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 marketing guy. But um, but these are the guys who are like and and the thing that I learned was is that you know here I am in medical school, but and some of these some of my mentors didn't even graduate college, let alone mm -hmm. high school. And, uh, and I don't want to say money is the only thing and they were very financially off, but they, I got to see a different way in how to earn a living. You know, it was always about, you know, trading time for dollars. That was the biggest thing was trading time for dollars with me. What can I break to do to develop multiple streams of income? And that's what they taught me. And it, uh, I know I'm going off in a tangent, but no. It just yeah, you're the idea is that if you're going to have a mentor, I would seek out more masterminds. And the best masterminds are when you're the dumbest person in the room. I'm sure you probably have this. When you're yeah. the dumbest person in the room, you want people who are much smarter than you, much different experiences that you can learn from. Yeah, no, I I, I love that. I um I think yeah, like just kind of to summarize your point and maybe add on a little bit. Like I think. Sometimes people are seeking out the one mentor who's going to provide the golden solution. But the thing with the yeah. mastermind groups is like maybe there's five or six people that have part of the solution or yeah. as you're talking, like you're brainstorming together and the idea comes or, you know, you, also like like above and below, like what does that really mean as opposed to like the collaborative sort of ideas and concepts and sometimes someone who's not even as experienced as you might say something and you're like, that makes a lot of sense. Maybe I should try that. Um, so, so yeah. And you know, we actually talked on uh, clubhouse, which is the, the new big right. thing right now. And that's almost like a pseudo mastermind thing it, happening. It and, and, and I, I've quickly learned that you are a master networker too. And that's another <laughs> important part of that being in masterminds is you may not have the answer but you may know that Joanne, you're like, hey, she's looking for the same thing. Let's connect you two. And I saw that right away. Um, I developed, you know, businesses from that. Just like people that we've met, you know, I've, I've had businesses with men masterminds, and then, and just like other referrals is like, um, just it just just gives a different perspective. Yeah, different perspective that if you're kind of trapped in like, I just want to work with medical students and work with doctors, and and that's great. But hey. I, you're developing something, maybe have another person from another area in health look at it or, you know, something that really that you don't even think about. It, it's good to have just different experiences and and to see how that business would work. Yeah. And I think that like speaks to the this sort of just idea of like staying open with your ideas, like don't hold on to it so much that you can't share what you're working on. Oh, I yeah. think I think there's um there's a lot of just fear in general around like this idea. This is my idea. But like yeah. at the end of the day, no one has time to execute on your thing usually, right? right. right? Like everyone's doing other things. And how is it that this person randomly is going to listen? Like, I'm going to take this. Um, so I think just having the courage a little bit to share 
some information to let people help you is um, is is really important. Um, Mike, sure. I, I know I've I've had you on for a little bit of time here. Um, I, I do want to respect your time, uh, and and you've jo- you've dropped a lot of great gems throughout the way. What do you think is um, something that you know? Again, I'm not going to boil it down because there's so many lessons and all of those things that you've you've gone through in life. But if if you had someone that was listening into this conversation, what would be something that you'd want to impart to them? I think uh, yeah, you know, there's so many different things. I guess it depends on where they're at. I think you know, right now is, I would gather a lot of your audience are in the medical space. Yeah. Are they they, residents and young attendings and and some med students as well? Is it's never too late to start developing a skill that can develop another stream of income for you. And it's not necessarily about starting a business, but if you're so inclined, you can start a business. It could be just about investing. You know, my thing is that I don't understand. If we want to be good at internal medicine, we study everything about internal medicine. If we want to be good with surgery, we start everything about general surgery. If we want to be good in terms of being financially successful, why don't most of us start to study financial literacy? We don't do that. We don't, medical schools don't offer it. And so I realized that if I want to be good at something, I need to start studying it and then implementing it. And I'm a big fan of Audible. I'm a big mm-hmm. fan of you know audiobooks. My my wife kind of kids me around and says, you never really read that book, but I listen to the book. And if you were involved in traffic or you know, you've you got these libraries that are in your car or on your phone or wherever you want to do, start studying those people because there are books out there which they basically give you uh, you know, the blueprint. This is what they did. You know, I love business biographies, but start studying that. So if you want to start developing streams of income, maybe you're not ready to start a business, start thinking about like, okay, how best do I invest my money? You know, I don't understand what 401ks are. Or, and, and I was the same way. I didn't mm-hmm. understand it, like until I realized why am I paying all this money, you know, to taxes and, and don't get me wrong. You know, I, I want to do my fair share, but I also want to be smart. And I follow other people who are like smart with their money and, uh, you know, doing things the right way. So start studying those things. And it's never too late to start, stu- you know, start developing an extra stream of income. And I just kind of want to leave with this. It was like, I work with some doctors who say, you tell me, but I can't do anything. I don't know anything other than being a doctor. And that drives me up the wall because I go, did you get into medical school? Well, obviously they say yes. Okay. Did you get into your residency? Yes, I did. Um, did you get into college? Okay. There are people who want to know how to get into medical school. Could you help them do that? Well, yeah, I guess I could. I, I, I don't have that, but that, that's what I'm, I'm talking about. No, well, that's a skill. That's something that you have and how you got into medical school may be different than how I got into medical school, how they tailored, but you did it. Yeah. And so um, there are, there's always something that is out there where you only, you have specialized knowledge of it. You only, you have that specialized experience and you know, other people think, Oh, there's other tutors that are out there, but only you have that specific thing that it might just resonate with that person, whatever that is. And I've seen million dollar businesses built upon that, that concept of just using your knowledge to help others. And it's so easy these days. And, you know, if it's creating a course, you know, it's as simple as doing a call like what we're doing right now. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, that's a course. Uh, you know, there are platforms like Udemy that you can put it on and and, and where you can actually start developing these things. And, and those are examples of courses that are out there and everybody can, d- can do it. Yeah. And uh, it's just going to be even more, more so with the advent of Zoom, unfortunately, because of the COVID. We're just used to distance learning. Mm-hmm. And it, that that industry is going to get even bigger and bigger. And it's just like, you don't want to be like, oh, man, I wish I could have done that. You know, it's like, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think to, to speak to this, too, it's like, you know, again, the, a great point. Like, there's definitely ways you can expand to trying something new, putting yourself out there, developing a concept, like seeing if it gets some traction seeing if you can help one person, seeing if you can help a few people. Right. And I think like the one thing is I think a lot of people shut it down 
because they're they're thinking about the million dollar successful business that's already done this. Yeah. But like you kind of pointed out in your really uh, one of the first stories you said, you know, you sold something for fifteen dollars and it helped pay off for what was it a truck? That yeah. You guys Brandon had. Tacoma. <laughs> yeah. Your your yeah your Tacoma right. So it helped it helped pay off for something. And sometimes I feel like if you could just develop a stream that made ten thousand dollars or right. one thousand dollars or just a little bit, that's still more. And you went for it and maybe you learned something and that thing is going to develop into the, into the other idea, right? That's way more than, uh, you sitting there, um, saying, woe is me and I can't try something. I literally, I have stuff that are, are online that pays me for the last 15 plus years. Wow. <laughs> guys that are out there that still pay me pay, pay, pay on that. But it's like two is, I think it's not only just about the money too. Is, so I talk about my book. I think there are three types of income. I think there's active income, which is your job. There's your passive income. We've talked about like investing and things. But I think also a lot of us need passion income. And passion income is like what gets you up in the day. So, mm. um, you know, when I'm talking and ta working with doctors, you know, Bootstrap and D is not my full-time gig. I'm, you know, <laughs> disclosure. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's what I enjoy though. You know, it gets me because when I have like, oh, I've got, you know, Jan, I'm seeing her tomorrow. We're helping her with her with her app. Okay, this is great. And, we, and you talk about these different ideas. That's what gets me passionate because I, I, I love working with my colleagues and all the time. Some of them mm -hmm. <laughs> a little harder than ever, but that's part of it. You know, I just I enjoy seeing something, you know, if we talk about like what gets me excited is seeing with someone who was like gets this idea and then obviously becomes a raging, raving success, but not even necessarily if it's like, you know, they're going to be, you know, retired from it, but mm -hmm. they saw like the path, like, oh my gosh, this can actually happen. I can actually do something. I'm starting to get a hundred dollars a month. That's a big deal. You know, like you said, a hundred dollars might not seem a lot, but that, you know, that could be your, your cable bill or, you know, or, or, you know, a few hundred, 500, maybe your car bill, your, your something like that. Uh, it, that's where you start to see, it's like, you don't have to be worried about that. And uh, that's what gets me excited. Yeah, I, I like to come up with the like analogy. It's like when you are passionate about something, when you really love it and you do it and you would do it for fun anyways, and then yeah. you make money off of that. It's like it's like drinking water, right? Yeah. Like everyone has to drink water. Like, oh, when I drink this glass of water, you're telling me you're going to pay me a hundred bucks. <laughs> uh, yeah, like, why not? I have to do that right. anyway. You know, so I, I think um, I think, yeah, for all of those reasons and more, I think absolutely like. To, to find a way to create that path for you is just so, so powerful. Now, um, Mike, you're doing so many things. Is there anything you want to plug any way that people can reach out to you? How can we support you? Yeah, best. Uh, so my main website is bootstrapmd.com, bootstrapmd.com. Uh, we have a podcast as well, a weekly podcast. Where we talk about business insights. I also try to highlight physician entrepreneurs, movers and shakers really who are, who are making a difference. And then it, on the website is my book, The Position Physician, and uh, you can find it on the website. You can find that on Amazon or wherever you you, you get your books. But uh, um, yeah, I just want to thank you for having the opportunity to be on your show, and uh, I was having a blast. I mean, yeah, it was, it was a great conversation. I'd love to uh, to keep it going and uh, very fun. Dr. Mike Wu Ming on the Happy Doc Podcast. Thanks everyone for watching and listening, uh, and I'll see you guys later. Oh,